Uh, right. So, uh, the so here you you see there's a exponential dependence on the number of qubits, which is uh, prohibitive if you want to learn a large system. Uh, but the dependence on epsilon is really good, which is a point I will come back to later on. Um, but uh, but here you see the exponential uh, in n is uh, not acceptable. We want a cost to be uh, at the most a poly n, uh, and we need to define a cost first. So uh, a natural way to define a cost is considered a query complexity. Uh, but here I would say it's not a very good measure because uh, say we can Imagine on one hand, we evolve for some very short time, t equal to 0 0.01. On the other hand, we evolve for some long time, 1,000. And in terms of query complexity, they will, they will be the same. They will just be one query each, right? But uh, so this ignores the fact that, that like ignoring for long time is more costly in experiments. Uh, so what we do is we use this measure of total evolution time, which means if we evolve for time t1, evolve for time t2, all the way to time Tn experiment, then the total evolution time is all these times added together. Uh, so this will be our main measure of cost. Uh, and we also uh, we also keep track of the number of experiments, which is n uh, experiment in the, in the example here, and uh, also the number of unitaries of, we apply during the time evolution. So these two metrics, we don't want them to blow up, but we mainly look at this total evolution time. So, so that's our cost model. Uh, and uh, so the problem we study is uh, closely connected to quantum metrology. Uh, so in quantum metrology, people generally care about high precision estimation of a few physical parameters. Uh, generally, people assume we, uh, we start with some good initial guess for these parameters that are kind of close to the exact value. And we perform measurement to generate new estimates uh, that uh, asymptotically converge to the exact value. And the convergence rate is governed by the quantum Fisher information. Uh, so quantum metrology is useful in a lot of things, such as detecting a gravitation, gravitational wave. Uh, and so in Hamiltonian learning, uh, the situation is a little bit different. Uh, we're, we care more about learning many parameters rather than uh, only a few. Uh, and we start without good uh, prior information. So in this way, we say our method is non-asymptotic, which means uh, like uh, we don't just care about the asymptotic behavior when you're close to the correct solution, but rather we care about the whole thing when you uh, start from scratch. Basically, you know only very rough information about the parameters. You only know they're between plus and minus one. And you need to uh, get to an arbitrary, arbitrarily designated um, precision uh, that is required. Uh, so a bit of history on this topic. Uh, the some of the earliest paper that I'm aware of on this problem are uh, mostly heuristic, uh, which are mainly based on optimization, Bayesian inference. And uh, uh, very, very early on, uh, some of these proposals were actually uh, implemented in experiment, but only for very simple systems, uh, such as on a single spin on NV center, uh, and also non intacting boson on super colliding qubits. Uh, and uh, uh, and only recently people have studied uh, like this problem with rigorous guarantee. Uh, so more precisely, we want to learn all the parameters uh, in the Hamiltonian, uh, and there are all n of them to precision epsilon with probability at least one minus delta. Uh, so the first paper that I'm aware of that proposed a rigorous uh, guarantee for the learning algorithm uh, was this paper in 2021 by Ha, Kodari, and Tang. Uh, so their paper was mainly about learning Hamiltonian from the Gibbs state, but you can actually extend their result to, uh, uh, and they actually extended their result to learning Hamiltonian from short time evolution as well. So if it, they want to learn all the parameters to precision epsilon, the scaling is like the, the total evolution time scale is like epsilon to the minus two time log uh, and over delta. So that's the, uh, cost they get. Uh, and uh, uh, there are several later works uh, improve their result in various ways, and I will not go into the detail here. Uh, and, uh, and in this uh, 2022 paper, the authors propose a way to learn Hamiltonian uh, with spam robustness. So by spam robust, I mean that uh, 
so in your learning protocol, you need to prepare initial state and the last system evolve and in and perform measurement. So they assume that uh, in the in the state preparation and in the measurement, there, there are some error. And the error takes the form of a quantum channel acting on the uh, state preparation and the, in the and before your measurement. So uh, so this error is uh, oftentimes the dominant source of error uh, in your experiment. And uh, uh, by spam robust, I mean that if this error is below a certain certain threshold, uh, the protocol can take you to arbitrarily high precision one. So this is a very desirable thing to have. And uh, in this 2022 paper, the authors propose a method that achieves this, but this comes at a price, which is the epsilon dependence went from epsilon to the minus two to epsilon to the minus four. Uh, so their method is mainly based on polychannel estimation. So they turn Hamiltonian learning problem into estimating a polychannel, which can be made a spam robust. So all these, uh, all these approaches, I would call them the perturbative approach, uh, the reason for which I will explain later. Uh, and in this uh, 2022 paper by uh, Robert, myself, uh, Difang, and Yuan Su, uh, we propose an algorithm that uses a technique called Hamiltonian reshaping uh, to learn a Hamiltonian with total evolution time that scales like epsilon inwards times log n over delta. And our method is also spam robust at the same time. Uh, so from here, you can see we basically combine all the good things from uh, previous algorithms. Uh, and this Hamiltonian reshaping technique requires us to uh, insert random poly operators during the time evolution. Uh, and uh, and one may ask, like, uh, is it necessary to do this? Like, uh, can we just prepare initial state, let it evolve, perform measurement at the end without doing anything in the middle? Uh, and uh, this recent paper uh, by the following set of authors uh, shows that this is impossible. Like. You need to have some quantum control in order to reach the Heisenberg limit. Without quantum control, you cannot reach the Heisenberg limit. Uh, so they they prove they prove some very nice theoretical justification for it. Uh, and uh, so far we've been focusing on uh, on qubit systems, but it is also uh, possible to extend the result to uh, bosonic systems as well, where uh, you have infinite dimensional hyperspace and unbounded operators. So here, instead of using random poly operators, we should use random Gaussian unitaries, uh, and that can achieve basically the same effect. We will still get this epsilon inverse total evolution time, but this time for both sides. Uh, so this is the uh, rough history of the development of this field. Uh, and the first, uh, and for here I will first tell you the main idea about the perturbative approach. And then I will show you why the perturbative approach cannot achieve the Heisenberg limit. And then I will talk about how to achieve the uh, Heisenberg limit. So uh, the perturbative approach, uh, uh, to remind you, we are studying this Hamiltonian that can be written as a linear combination of polys. Uh, the key observation in the perturbative approach is that the time evolution operator due to H is almost linear in H when T is small. So Based on that, we can do experiment in the following way. So we start from a state rho, evolve for time t, and a measure observable O. Uh, and the expectation value we see is, is like this. It is trace rho uh, times the time evolved operator O. Uh, so uh, now we take derivative at time t equal to 0. What we get will be uh, a trace rho and commutator H and O. So because this, uh, this thing, we can actually like cyclically uh, permute uh, rho h and o, and then uh, what we get is, uh, is, is this form. So this is a very nice thing because it has the structure of a uh, Huber speed inner product. And uh, which means if we want to extract the coefficient uh, corresponding to p from this expression, what we need to do is to choose o and rho such that their commutator is uh, proportional to p. And once we have that, we can uh, just take this thing back into here, and it will tell us that the derivative is exactly minus 2 times lambda p. So because lambda p is what we want to ex estimate, we only need to estimate this derivative, which is available to us from uh, experiment. Uh, so I, I see there's a question from chat. Uh, uh, yeah, so. 
the Heisenberg limit is having the uh, procedure to be absolute inverse. So that's that's correct. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, let me keep going. So now we we know it, as long as we can estimate the derivative, we will get we will get a coefficient, and that then we will talk about how to estimate the derivative. So derivative can be estimated accurately using polynomial interpolation because there are uh, many coefficients to learn. So many derivatives can be estimated simultaneously using classical shadows. Uh, so this, I think this is the main idea of this 2022 paper by Steve Franca and co-authors. Uh, and uh, we need to estimate those expectation values through sampling and taking average. Uh, that will necessarily involve a statistical error. Uh, and the error decays like one over square root of NS, where NS is the number of samples. Uh, so our total evolution time t will be uh, proportional to the number of samples. Uh, and because if we want to achieve uh, epsilon precision, uh, because this kind of error decay, you would need to take NS to be epsilon to the minus two uh, in order to achieve the desired precision. That means t will scale like the epsilon to the minus two. And this is the standard quantum limit. But what we want is the highest of the limit. Uh, t equal to absolute inverse, uh, not equal to, but proportional to. Uh, so we want this kind of scaling, which is quadratically better than this uh, absolute to the minus two. Uh, and uh, the sample complexity can actually be made very small. It can be made log absolute inverse, as you will see later. Uh, so you see there's a gap between what is achieved uh, by this perturbative approach and, the, and what we want to achieve and can actually achieve. Uh, and the perturbative approach cannot achieve the Heisenberg limit. So you cannot just fine tune some parameter to make it achieve the Heisenberg limit. Uh, this can be shown rigorously. So in perturbative approach, we also we choose uh, time to be uh, O1, which is some constant. Uh, and this tells us that each experiment we perform, the outcome distribution will have Fisher information that is also some constant. And we need the Fisher information of all experiments to be on the order epsilon to the minus two in order to estimate the parameters to precision epsilon. Uh, so this is guaranteed by the Kramer rock bound. So this argument tells that we need epsilon to the minus two experiments to get to epsilon standard deviation. Uh, and that, that simply tells us that we cannot possibly achieve the highest limit. Uh, but this argument works only for non-adaptive uh, case and uh, only when we want an unbiased estimation. Uh, but we can extend the proof to the adaptive and the biased case as well. So we can show even if you use adaptive procedure and you accept a biased estimate, you will still not be able to get to a high Heisenberg limit if you take t uh, to be O1. Uh, so that means reaching the Heisenberg limit requires something qualitatively different. You cannot just uh, fine tune the previous procedures to, to get there. Uh, any question at this point? Okay, uh, right. Uh, so, so far we have seen the perturbative approach. Uh, you have seen an argument saying why it is impossible to achieve the Heisenberg limit with the perturbative approach. Now I will give you a, the simplest example I can find of how to achieve the Heisenberg limit. So let's consider a time dependent signal S of T, uh, which is rotating with a single frequency theta uh, and, and there is some noise in the signal. So here I write G as a Gaussian noise, but it doesn't really have to be Gaussian. I just write it this way for concreteness. And uh, we know that theta is between minus one and one, and we want to learn it precision epsilon. Uh, so one way to learn theta is of course, just to fix T, average our noise. So we get E to the I theta T, take the log and that's it. Uh, and uh, uh, if we want to estimate theta to precision epsilon, we will need uh, to estimate e to the i theta t to precision epsilon as well. So that means averaging out the noise. Uh, sorry, could you repeat your question? I couldn't hear it. Hello? Uh, has there been a question? Uh, uh, if, if not, I would just keep going. So, mm, yeah, so we need a we need to suppress the noise so that it's on the order epsilon, uh, and that means we need take uh, we'll need epsilon to the minus two many samples, which 
directly tells us there is no Heisenberg limit in, in this approach. So I will outline a different approach. Uh, so this method uh, uses uh, log epsilon inverse many examples and epsilon inverse total evolution time. So the method is essentially follows the same idea as this 2015 paper by uh, by this set of authors that propose a robust phase estimation algorithm for gate calibration. Uh, so just to remind you, by total evolution time, I mean that if we're using example ST1, ST2, STNS, then the total evolution time is T1 plus T2 all the way to TNS. Uh, so the main building block of this uh, of this method is following uh, a decision problem. So basically we reduce the uh, we reduce this estimation problem into uh, into a decision problem. Uh, the decision problem is as follows. Suppose we know that theta is between A and B, and we want to ask the following question. Is it in the left two-third of this interval or the right two-third of the interval? Uh, so at the beginning, we know theta is between minus 1 and 1, so we know that A is minus 1, B is 1. And we want to ask, is it in, the, is it in this part uh, or, or this part? So why is it useful to ask this question? So if we if we can successfully answer this question, then uh, we can update. Uh, uh, so suppose we know theta is in here, then we can uh, keep a the same and update b to be this value, right? Uh, and by doing this, we will have a pair of new a and b such that they are closer to each other uh, than from the beginning. And if we know theta is in this part, then we can similarly keep B the same, but update A. Uh, so each time we do this, we'll get a new pair of A and B, such that uh, they still sandwich uh, theta between them, but they are like a one third closer to each other uh, compared to the previous step. So we can reduce the uncertainty by one third at each step and takes only log epsilon inward steps uh, for, for A and B to converge from both sides to theta. Uh, and when they are epsilon, uh, close together, you'll, you'll be able to estimate theta to the desired precision. So the, the key point is only log epsilon inverse many steps uh, is, is already enough. So, uh, so this means we, our estimation problem can be reduced to this decision problem with very little overhead. Uh, now the question is like how to solve this decision problem. Uh, the decision problem we solve by looking at this uh, this function, which is a uh, shifted and rescale sine function, uh, and what you need to remember from this expression is only that you can you can evaluate the function from the signal. So you only need to evaluate as t star at this time t star, uh, which is equal to pi over b minus a. Uh, so as a and b get closer and closer together, this t star will also grow correspondingly larger, which means it's uh, more expensive to generate a generate example of ST star in terms of the total evolution time. Um, so this function will help us determine where theta is uh, based on the following observation. So it is a monotonously increasing function um, from A to B. Uh, so when the function value is below one half, uh, we will know that uh, theta is actually in these two parts of the interval. Right, because simply because this uh, function is monotonously increasing. And if the function value is above minus one half, then theta must be in these two parts of the interval. Uh, so uh, the important thing is that uh, we, we only need to evaluate this function to precision one half, like very low precision, in order to correctly determine where theta is. Uh, so, uh, and because we eventually want to estimate theta to precision epsilon, right? So if if the if we need to evaluate f a b theta to some precision epsilon, then that will again take us to the uh, standard quantum limit. But rather here we only need to evaluate the precision one half, uh, so which is already enough for distinguishing uh, these two cases. So you can see there is a gap as large as one. Uh, so. And we need to be able to do this with very high confidence. So what we do is, uh, in order to get to confidence level one minus delta prime, we just take log delta prime inverse many examples and do a majority voting. That will require uh, that that will take us to the desired confidence level. Uh, so, is there any question at this point?
uh, right. So uh, here uh, we we and we have this way of uh, of determining determining whether data is in these two parts of interval or these two parts of interval. And and uh, from the previous slide, you have already seen that as long as we can solve this decision problem, we'll be able to estimate data to any precision we want. So now basically we have the algorithm uh, by combining these two together. So, uh, and and then we can analyze the cost. So at, at the last third step, uh, the, the distance between B and A will be uh, on the order uh, epsilon. Uh, so that means the cost of the last third step uh, will be uh, will be on the order epsilon inwards. So so look, yeah, the cost of the last step is basically epsilon inwards times log delta prime inwards, where delta prime is the uh, failure probability we can tolerate, which should be very small. And the total cost is just the cost of all the steps added together. Uh, so we have the cost of the last step. Uh, the cost of the previous step is actually two thirds of that. And you can add, add the older uh, the cost of all the steps together, which gives you a geometric sequence, and add up to a constant. So in the end, the, the cost the total evolution time you have is just absolutely worse. Uh, so we need the we need the failure probability of each step to be really small, uh, just uh, just using a union bound. But that's fine because uh, we have this uh, majority voting procedure to exponentially boost the success probability. Uh, so this, in the end, the total evolution time will scale like uh, epsilon inverse times uh, log delta inverse, and the number of examples scales like uh, uh, log epsilon inverse. So you can compare it with the a naive approach I talked about at the beginning, where you get epsilon to the minus two here and epsilon to the minus two here. And moreover, this uh, protocol has the nice property that is it is robust to noise. Uh, so it is not only robust to some uh, some some like a unbiased noise, but also you can have bias in the noise. So as long as the bias plus standard deviation is below uh, some constant level, we will be able to estimate data to arbitrarily high precision. So in, in, this is a sort of span robustness, although this this example is uh, completely classical rather than quantum. Um, so so any question at this point? Yeah, I have a quick question. So I think like you mentioned the a lower bound when we're epsilon squared before and here, like the scaling is better than that. I guess like the lower bound does not apply in this case. It's really because this method is adaptive. So is that correct or? Uh, well, it's not because it's adaptive, rather it's because we are choosing T to be large. Like uh, previously we were looking at T equal to O1, but here it is epsilon inverse rather than O1. So I, I think that's the difference. Okay, it's kind of like a, okay, you are choosing like T to be, so, so the previous bound is sound like maybe the, the uh, okay, you, you, you can only choose the T to be like O1, and then like that is kind of like a lower bound for the number of the samples that you have. But like here's yes. it's kind of like you are making the, probably by choosing lar larger T, you are making the circuit depths to be, to be like, to be high and then like you can just like get some better costs. Exactly, so, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you for asking this question. And thank you for helping me clarify this point. <laughs> yeah, this is a very important point. Uh, so we need to uh, we need to evolve for a long time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, so so how is this relevant for the quantum scenario? So we can we can consider a very simple Hamiltonian, uh, h equal to theta z. So this this is basically your, your quantum system only evolves a z operator on a single qubit. And we want to learn the parameter theta from dynamics. So what we can do is we start from a plus state, evolve for time t and measuring in the x basis. What we get will be cosine two theta t. Uh, and we can do the same thing, but measuring the y basis, what we get will be minus sine two theta t. Uh, so now let's just combine these two expectation values together. So we will get a signal that's e to the uh, two i theta t plus some noise. So that's exactly the scenario I described uh, before for the for the for the single frequency signal plus noise uh, scenario, right? And this means we can just simply apply the uh, the method I just described uh, to the data you generate from quantum experiment, uh, the, these simple experiments, and that will help you estimate what the data is, thereby telling you uh, the Hamiltonian governing the time evolution of the system. Um, and so now uh, you have seen that uh, in the perturbative approach, we cannot achieve the Heisenberg limit 
Uh, but in this this simple example of a single qubit Hamiltonian, we are able to achieve the highest limit. Uh, so what is the reason for that, right? Uh, and uh, by comparing these two, uh, and also as uh, Don has asked this question, like reaching the highest limit requires long time evolution. Uh, and uh, if you only restrict to short time evolution, you will never be able to get there. Uh, but if we look at the uh, many body systems, then it, it will present us with a, additional difficulty, which is uh, many body systems thermalize during time evolution, uh, which means if you look at a local observable O, and look at its uh, late time expectation value, it will be roughly the same as its thermal expectation value. Uh, so that means uh, if you if you evolve for longer and longer, the expectation value stops changing. Uh, and therefore evolving for longer does not yield more information. That will simply uh, be saying that all the information you get at late time is equivalent to what you get at some a fixed amount of time. Uh, so that will preclude preclude us from reaching the high speed limit. Uh, and you may also ask, like, can we use non-local observables to get to get to the high speed limit? Uh, and uh, and there's this result from from uh, this paper I listed here that uh, under the I guess say thermalization hypothesis, and if you're learning many parameters at the same time, uh, even non-local observables cannot help you learn these parameters uh, with high speed limited scaling. So, uh, so this is the additional difficulty we encounter when we deal with many body systems rather than just a single qubit. Uh, so now we need some way to overcome this difficulty. And the, the uh, so one may think of the opposite of uh, thermalization to be uh, some kind of localization, right? So if we have an abundance of local conservation laws, uh, that can help us prevent thermalization. Uh, we can think of uh, integral models that uh, don't thermalize at all, or a system that thermalize very slowly, uh, such as uh, many body localized systems. So in, in both examples, there's an abundance of local conservation laws that uh, kind of prevent thermalization. Uh, so the key idea of our approach is that we artifi artificially create conservation laws, uh, and and then we use uh, we use that to uh, get coherent signal at late times. Uh, and to create conservation laws, we use this technique called Hamiltonian reshaping, which is done by inserting random poly operators. Uh, so the time evolution operator is e, is e to the minus IHT, and we can divide it into little, uh, the entire time evolution into little, little segments, each of length tau, uh, and between uh, those short time evolutions, we insert poly operators P1, P2, all the way to PR, uh, where those PJs are uniformly randomly drawn from a poly subgroup K. So GN here is the poly subgroup, uh, the, the poly group, K is the subgroup of it. Uh, and uh, because those PJs are uh, poly operators, so we can move them uh, up into the exponent uh, to get uh, this expression. Uh, now we can look at like what's going on in each short time step. Uh, so rho gets mapped to a quantum state that is rho minus uh, expectation value of, of, of this commutator uh, up to some second order error. Hmm. So the expectation value is taken over all the uh, all the elements of uh, of this subgroup K uh, and and it is uniformly distributed over this subgroup. Uh, so what we do is to move uh, this uh, expectation value inside the commutator, and we will end up with uh, effective Hamiltonian. And the effective Hamiltonian takes the following form. So it is the expectation value of all the PHP. So you can you, you can write it out as an average of all the uh, uh, all the PHP where P is an element in K. Uh, and the, the the time evolution operator is transformed accordingly. It goes from uh, e to the minus i h t to e to the minus i h effective t. <clears throat> uh, so this is the same idea underlying the Q-drift algorithm where you, you randomize the terms to, but, but in the end, your effective Hamiltonian is still the target Hamiltonian one to simulate. Uh, sorry, uh, you like, yeah, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. So there's like a question in the chat. So it's like, uh, yes. can you explain again why thermalization makes parameter estimation hard? 
Uh, well, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, let me try to explain further. So, uh, so remember in the previous protocol, we need this, <clears throat> uh, this expectation, uh, this T to be large, right? Uh, and we just don't, uh, we don't just choose a uh, one large T, but we choose uh, a sequence of different T, uh, such that uh, and 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 each of them is like increasingly larger until you reach one or epsilon. Uh, and we need to look at the expectation value. But here, generalization tells us that like it's like you just increasing t doesn't help you because uh, because you will keep getting the same value as if you're choosing a small t, right? Because the system has normalized and stopped the ch it has stopped the changing. So that's telling that is telling us the previous the, the data we were using for the previous high super limit approach doesn't cannot uh, like a large chunk of it is pretty much just useless. So this means we cannot reach the high super limit just just using the uh, approach I described previously. So does that answer your question? Recording in progress. Okay, I guess it's good. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. Then I'll just keep going. Um, right. Uh, so here our Hamiltonian is transformed in the following way when we when we insert those random poly operators. So H becomes this effective Hamiltonian that is averaged over all the PHP. Uh, and uh, so why are we doing this? Right. So the effect of this transformation is that every element in K is now a conservation law in the effective Hamiltonian. <clears throat> so we can easily check this. So let's just pick any element Q in K and compute. QH effective Q. You can write it out this way by just using the definition of H effective. And because P is uniformly randomly drawn from K, uh, Q is an element in it, uh, then actually P times Q is also uniformly randomly drawn from K. So uh, this means this expression is actually the same as this expression. So what we get is still H effective. So this tells us that Q and H effective commute with each other. Uh, so there, therefore, Q is a conservation law in which effective. Uh, and so in this way, we actually create a lot of conservation laws by, uh, by, by just randomly applying elements in K. Uh, and the, the second thing we need to ensure is that the coefficients we want to learn are preserved in this process. So this we can check as well. So let's look at a, a poly operator P prime uh, that is in the Hamiltonian H. So we look at how it gets transformed during the process. Uh, so there are actually two possible outcomes. So either P prime is in the centralizer of K. Uh, in that scenario, P, P prime, P will always just be P prime. And when you take, take average, you will end up with P prime. Uh, and there is a second scenario where P prime is not in the centralizer of K. In that scenario, uh, P prime will actually anti-commute with half of the elements in K and the commute with the other half. So you will get P prime half of the time minus P prime the other half of the time. Uh, and if you take average, you'll end up with zero in that. Uh, so this is telling us that the effective Hamiltonian we get is the sum over, over all the lambda PP, uh, where P is in the centralizer of K. So that means you can see those, those coefficients lambda P are the same coefficients as before. So the, so, they just become more sparse when we uh, when we apply this uh, random unit terms. Uh, so, and, any question? Okay, uh, right. So, let's look at a concrete example of how it works. Uh, so, here, let's think of a one D system of each qubit interacting with its neighbors. <clears throat> so, we choose k to be generated by z three, z six, z nine x3, x6, x9, and so on. Uh, so what happens here is that uh, a poly operator K, uh, P is in the centralizer of K only when it acts trivially on qubits 3, 6, and 9. Uh, so basically, uh, if H has only nearest neighbor interaction, then the system will be decoupled. Uh, so as more concretely, uh, uh, for example, let's think about a x, x term between uh, these qubit two and three, uh, then it will 
it will fail to be in the centralizer of k uh, for the, for this k that we choose. Uh, so what we get uh, effectively is that this term gets killed. So these two qubits are no longer coupled together. So what happens is that basically you no longer have qubits three and six and nine in your system, but rather you only have qubits one, two interacting with each other, but not with the rest of the system. Uh, qubits four and five interacting with each other, but not with the rest of the system. So basically from now on, you don't need to deal with a n-body Hamiltonian, but rather uh, your, your Hamiltonian only involves the pairs of qubits interacting with each other. So you only need to deal with two qubit systems uh, separately. Uh, and we we can also use this approach to make the effective Hamiltonian diagonal uh, in a certain basis. For example, we can choose uh, k to be gener generated by x1, x2, x3, and so on. Uh, so if we do that, then the effective Hamiltonian we get will be diagonal in the, in the x basis. So that will also make our estimation easier. So we combine these two things. We use conservation laws to decouple the system into non-interacting clusters each evolving under a Hamiltonian that is diagonal with respect to a known basis. Uh, and the Hamiltonian coefficients are preserved in the process. Um, so this procedure uh, can be generalized to all bounded degree local Hamiltonians. Uh, so each, uh, which means like each term in a Hamiltonian involve only O1 qubits and each qubit is involved in only O1 terms. Uh, right, uh, and the, uh, uh, so if you're familiar with dynamical decoupling, this procedure might uh, make you think that, like there, there's some connection between them. So uh, there, there is indeed a close connection between these two approaches, but I would say the subgroup-based approach uh, is more versatile because you get to choose with which, which group, subgroup K you want to apply here. Uh, and uh, uh, there is a similar subgroup-based strategy that can be used to, to suppress coherent errors in quantum circuits proposed in, in this paper. Uh, so any question at this point? Uh, so, so to summarize, based on the Hamiltonian reshaping technique, we propose a Hamiltonian learning protocol that achieved the Heisenberg limit uh, with this epsilon inverse total evolution time. And, uh, and the protocol only uses polylog uh, absolute inverse many experiments, which is much better than the previous absolute to the minus two result. Uh, and moreover, our protocol uses only single qubit poly eigenstates, uh, poly gates, and the single qubit measurements. So you don't need to prepare entangled state. You also don't need to, uh, say, apply uh, uh, entangled measurement. And gates you apply in the in the middle are all, only like a single qubit gates. Uh, the whole procedure is also robust against state preparation and measurement error. So, so I think these are basically all the nice things you would want to have. Sorry, you, um, can I ask a quick okay. question? This is Andrew uh, Bill, by sure. the way. Yeah. Um, so you describe the perturbatively, like to first order, that you get this effective Hamiltonian evolution, right? And so that was yeah. dependent on this parameter, time parameter tau. Um, right. I, could you maybe flash that slide again where you got the tau and then show, because it seems to be perturbative otherwise, right? But um, yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. you're arguing so, it's not. Yeah, yeah, uh, thanks for this question. Uh, so uh, here, uh, this tau, uh, let me try to find it. Yeah, this this tau here. So the, the experiment doesn't just run for time tau, but rather it runs for a long time t, but it cut into short segments, mm -hmm. each of lines tau. And uh, mm -hmm. okay. indeed, as observed by Andrew, there is a there is a second order error here, right? So that means if you want to achieve higher precision, you will need to evolve for longer time, and that means the cumulative error in the end will need to be controlled, right? So which means this tau needs to be smaller if you want to uh, evolve for longer time. So more uh, more concretely. Uh, for this approach, if you want to reach epsilon precision, the tau you choose needs to be on the order epsilon as well. Uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah, this is actually an important point. <clears throat> uh, but I would want to say, like, however, is, uh, however you choose tau, it doesn't doesn't affect the total evolution time because, like, you're you're just dividing uh, like a certain amount of time into more segments, but still, 
the total evolution time is the same. Gotcha. Yeah, thanks. And if you evolve for a long enough time without like taking tau to be small enough, then you get like this randomized compiling, right? You end up with like a stochastic kind of Yes, yes, exactly. Noise. I think you will end up mm -hmm. some with some like a decoherence because like uh, this term is not not yeah. really a like a yeah, no longer coherent time evolution anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. Cool. Yeah, thanks for this question. Oh. Right. Um, okay. So so far we've been talking Are, about. Uh, there's like a there's like another question in the chat. So, uh -huh. like, do you have an intuition for if it is possible to do this on an experimental setup, like in a spin chain, or do we have the control to turn off some terms in the system Hamiltonian? Uh, turn off some terms. Well, uh, yes, if you can selectively turn off the uh, terms in the Hamiltonian, I would say you will probably achieve the same effect as uh, as, as this random poly approach. So uh, you could actually, so you can also think of like turning on a certain term. So if you can make it really strong, it will ha also have roughly the same effect as, as this uh, random poly approach. So, uh, so I think there are many ways to um, to kill off interactions and which one is the like a uh, most implementable experimentally uh yeah i would say that that is like a system dependent right so uh, yeah i think th there's there's a lot of to figure out figure out about how to ex implement it experimentally but i think there are many approaches and uh, at least one of them should be promised uh, yes uh, any uh, like the, does that answer your question yeah, I think, yeah, that's good. Then. Oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, right. So, so far we've been talking about qubits, uh, but we can do something similar for bosons as well. Uh, so uh, here for concreteness, let's consider this, uh, this boss hover Hamiltonian where we have uh, hopping between uh, bosonic modes. And uh, uh, so bosonic modes are here arranged on, on some kind of lattice. Uh, and we, we have hopping between adjacent sites. And we have some on-site, uh, like on-site energy, and also on-site interaction for each bosonic mode. Uh, so what we want to do here is to learn the coefficients h i j, omega i, and uh, c i. Uh, so we, we can do something very similar to the uh, qubit setting, but uh, it, it no longer makes sense to talk about uh, like poly operators in the, uh, in the in the bosonic setup. So what we do is we apply random Gaussian terms. <coughs> uh, as an example, we can apply this uh, e to the i theta n i, which is a phase shifter with a random angle theta uh, from zero to two pi. Uh, so the effect uh, of this uh, random uh, random unitary is that it enforces a local particle number conservation, uh, which is a U1 symmetry. Uh, so what it does is that it can be used to isolate parts of the quantum system because once we have this local particle number conservation, no particle can hop to or from side i. So that effectively blocks any transport that goes through this this bosonic mode. Uh, and uh, uh, and a second thing we can do with random uh, Gaussian unitaries is to apply this uh, random beam splitters. So what it, what, it, what it does is that it enforces a conservation that is on the, of the form uh, bi dagger bj plus bj dagger bi. So this is not a, us not a, not a conservation law we see usually uh, because it's like a, a off diagonal term. But once we have this, uh, this kind of conservation law, we can learn the, the coefficients associated with, with these operators, these hopping terms. So that will help us learn the hopping terms in the Hamiltonian. We can similarly do it for the for this this operator as well. So i uh, bi dagger bj minus i bj dagger bi. Uh, so basically, with these two approaches, uh, the uh, random phase shifter and the random beam splitters, uh, we will be able to just learn all the all the uh, coefficients in the Hamiltonian. Uh, so so this beam splitter is also used uh, to kind of diagonalize these terms. And by by just uh, changing the single particle basis, uh, so based on this, we propose a protocol for learning the both Hubbard type Hamiltonian, uh, 
uh, with the following cost. First, uh, it achieves the Heisenberg limit scaling, uh, epsilon inverse total evolution time, uh, and it uses uh, polylog epsilon inverse many experiments. Uh, and here, instead of using uh, using uh, like uh, using random poly operators and uh, poly eigenstates, we have the following set of resources. Uh, we use coherent states at the very beginning, uh, random one or two mode Gaussian unitaries during the time evolution, and we perform homonyme measurements at the very end. So uh, these are uh, all elements of linear optics if we talk about experimental setup. So, so they are uh, basically the natural thing to consider for a bosonic system. Uh, and this approach is also robust against state progression and measurement error. Uh, so uh, so don't can you remind me of how much time I have left? Yeah, you have eight minutes, but probably just want to like kind of like wrap it up so we can have some time for questions as well. Okay, yeah, yeah. Then I guess I will skip the open problems and uh, uh, yeah, so so if you're interested, you can ask me about open problems. So uh, so to conclude, uh, Hamiltonian learning in the high Heisenberg limit requires long time evolution, as you have seen from the uh, analysis of this perturbative approach. And we need uh, control to artificially create conservation laws to put off thermalization, as you have seen like in the in the discussion about thermalization, where if you have thermalization, you cannot reach the Heisenberg limit. And the open questions remain as to how fast and strong the control needs to be and the tolerance of quantum noise, which is uh, about open problems that I didn't really discuss. Uh, Okay, yeah, and, and with that, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks you for the for the very interesting talk. And we're, we have like a few minutes for questions and yeah, please feel free to unmute yourself and say hi to the speaker and ask your question. Well, I've already asked a question, but I maybe I'll ask another. How are you? Um, this uh, so it seems like this approach might be generalizable to learning Lindbladian um, as well as Hamiltonian. Um, have you thought about that at all? Yes, I've thought about that, but uh, it seems to me that if we want to Lindbladian is by by itself uh, like dissipating, right? So it will. Mm. Like if you're say if you have enough Lindbladian term, you you can make sure that the uh, the system will evolve some to some stationary, uh, like uh, to some fixed point uh, if you evolve long enough. So I would say that mm -hmm. has the same effect as thermalization, uh, mm -hmm. which means you cannot reach a high simple limit if you're directly dealing with Lindbladian uh, terms. Uh, but I think mm -hmm. there is still hope. Like uh, so in in quantum metrology, people can deal with Lindbladian terms. So that's actually related to this uh, this open question, which I think I should just talk about here. Uh, so uh, in uh, yeah, in quantum metrology, people have studied like using quantum error correction to deal with Lindbladian terms in a Hamiltonian. Uh, so uh, so the setup is as follows: we, you have a Hamiltonian. Uh, in, in your master equation. You also have some the value terms in your master equation. So as long as the coefficient you want to learn uh, is associated with Hamiltonian terms that are not in the span of your Lindbladian terms, then you will be able to use quantum error correction to learn the coefficient to the Heisenberg limit. So this was proposed in this 2018 paper by uh, by the by Sizzo and the co-authors. So, uh, yeah, so I think this is a really revolutionary idea. And uh, in, the, in the scenario of Hamiltonian learning, uh, we should think about like how to, uh, how to generalize this approach to learning many parameters and also how to do it non-asymptotically. So in this 2018 paper, they, I think they only calculated the Fisher information, which tells you the 